Well, here we go again. We've got another episode of Game of Crimes with Murph in the Morning. And a very special welcome back to all you loyal and faithful listeners and followers. I got to say, you guys keep me motivated to bring on the best and sometimes some rather unusual guests, but the best ones I can find. I tell you what, as long as you're supporting me, I'm going to do my best to support you with the best entertaining and enlightening interviews I can find anywhere. After all, you know, this is the place to hear some of the best true crime content, right? Episodes where you'll hear firsthand, real life, true stories of heroes in action. Now, I'm talking about our law enforcement professionals, our military heroes, and our first responders. This is where you'll hear about their dedication to duty, commitment to excellence, bravery in the face of danger, and the sacrifices they make to protect all of us. You know, I also like to recognize our unsung hero, and that's the families of those who serve. The families who really don't get any recognition, they don't know if those heroes will return after their shift is over after the deployment ends, after that emergency has been taken care of, they never know if the next phone call or knock on the door will be the bad news that something has gone terribly wrong and that their loved ones will never return. Unfortunately, those calls and visits are becoming more frequent nowadays, aren't they? So as long as Game of Crimes is on the air, I promise to promote these heroes and their families in the most positive light possible to give them the recognition they deserve and to help you, the listeners, learn more about what these heroes face on a daily basis, regardless of where we are. This is what makes Game of Crime so different from so many other true crime podcasts, having the people on here to tell you the story from their perspective. And as I mentioned last week, and you already know this, you'll occasionally hear from a former bad guy on the show. That's all I know. That sounds a little crazy, right? But that's what Morgan and I started, and that's what I plan to continue to do. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not glorifying or making excuses for criminals by giving them a platform here. But keep in mind what our criminal justice system does and how it works. Once a person has paid their debt to society, in other words, they did their time in prison as deemed appropriate by a judge and jury, then we accept them back into the mainstream society. That's the way this thing works. If they screw up again, well, we send them right back to prison. The reason I bring former criminals on the show is so that we all learn about what they did and how they did it and why they did it. I learned from these folks as well, and I'm retired. It gives us all a look at crime and the criminal justice system from their perspective. And to be quite frank, some of our most popular interviews here are with these folks. You guys seem to like these. Anyway, many of you know I was recently at the Southern California Gang Conference. This was my fifth or sixth year supporting them. I love going out there. I mean, you talk about meeting heroes face-to-face. This is the place to do it. Two years ago, Morgan and I started taking a portable recording system out there to the conference where we interviewed some of the guests. We did it in person. That was different. I did the same thing again this year, and I ran into four previous Game of Crimes guests, all of whom gave me their time for another interview to update us on what they've been doing since the last time we heard from them. Also, I got an interview with another former bad guy. This guy served 45 years in prison for a double homicide. He says he didn't commit. I don't know if he did or not. I'm not going to tell you his story, but you'll hear all about it when when I do have his episode on. However, I will say I was impressed with his attitude, his demeanor, his professionalism, how he handled himself, how he survived in prison, and especially with what he's doing now. Now, who are these people I'm talking with (laughs) or talking about? Well, you're just going to have to wait and tune into future episodes to find out. You know, just a little teaser there. i got to try to keep you guys interested, right? Now, this week's guest is another experienced law enforcement professional with 29 years as a Chicago police officer, Rick Rybecki. He worked his way up the ladder from patrolman to lieutenant, and as you're going to hear, he could have gone higher in rank, but he chose to take a different path. I was introduced to Rick by Patrick O'Donnell. There's another former Game of Crimes guest. He was in episode 77. Patrick is a good Irishman who served with the Milwaukee Police Department, retired as a sergeant. We know him as Sarge. He now runs his own podcast, Cops and Writers. So go check him out, Cops and Writers. And Patrick, brother, thank you very much for this introduction. This is a great, another great interview, in my opinion. And that's my show, so that counts. It also counts what you folks think. All right, before we get into this week's episode, let's get this housekeeping stuff out of the way. I say this every week. Head on over to Apple or Spotify and hit those five stars for me, please. 
I really don't know how it works, but it does help us with the ratings, and it only takes a second to do that. So I appreciate you heading on over. You can send your comments and feedback on on Spotify or our email address, which is gameofcrimespodcast at gmail.com. I need to hear your thoughts. Let me know what we're doing right, what we're doing wrong, and if there's anything special you'd like to hear. Uh, got an email yesterday from a listener, Duke. I'll leave it at that uh, with another great suggestion. Uh, you can also check out our website, gameofcrimespodcast.com. If you haven't visited the site yet, that's where you'll find all the episodes, our book list, our merch, and some other stuff. And that's gameofcrimespodcast.com. On social media, on Facebook and Instagram, you can find us at Game of Crimes Podcast. And on X, formerly known as Twitter, you can just type in game of crimes i'm still working to post on x but uh, they keep resisting me and i'm not far away from just canceling it all together uh, just what a pain all right also on facebook now you got to check this out the game of crimes fan club that's type in game of crimes fan club this is the best private group on the facebook platform it's run by our favorite mafia queen sandy salvato she's the lady that rules with an iron fist but you know what she wears a velvet glove she's got that soft touch What I really like about this, it's not all about the podcast over there. These folks, they're posting some funny comments, some funny cartoons, some funny jokes. But the thing I really like about it is when somebody's going through a rough patch, they look out for each other. So check us out, Game of Crimes Fan Club. And last but not least, we have Patreon.com slash Game of Crimes. Now, by the time you hear this episode, I'm praying that we have Patreon back online. It was on hold for several weeks while I learned how to record, edit, post, and all the other good stuff you got to do for a kick-ass podcast. I was shooting for June 1st uh, as the date to reactivate Patreon, but when I went to uh, work with that and had Mr. Morgan working with me, the connection problems just, they defeated us both. Morgan couldn't even figure it out, so if he can't figure it out, there's no way in heck I'm going to figure it out. But I've sent in a help request to Patreon and and Acast and uh, waiting to hear back from them now. And just so you know, I'm recording this on June 3rd, so that's what I'm saying. Keep your fingers crossed that by the time you hear this, Patreon is back up. And just remember, that's patreon.com slash game of crimes. Now, quick disclaimer, this is a show about crime. We talk about bad people doing bad things and bad people doing bad things to good people. I do take all these stories very seriously. But you know, it never hurts to have a little laugh and a little levity in our lives, does it? And to that end... You know what that means. It means that it's time for Small Town Police Splatter. (laughs) All right, here we go with this week's stories. We have in Arizona, an Arizona woman dressed as a nun and carrying a Bible in her lap. That sounds like a nice lady. Well, she was arrested when a search of the car she was riding in with her husband turned up more than eight pounds of fentanyl. Esther Gomez de Aguilar, 53 years old, and her spouse were were pulled over while traveling on Interstate 10 in Elo, Arizona, a city 50 miles northwest of Tucson. The cops said the couple's vehicle was stopped due to an equipment violation and a moving violation. Hmm. That just makes me a little suspicious that they might have had a tip, but you never know. Upon contacting the app, the passengers, the deputy noticed several suspicious circumstances that prompted him to search the vehicle. When he frisked the couple, he, <laughs> when he frisked the couple, he struck pay dirt with Gomez. According to police, Gomez's purse contained four bundles of suspected fentanyl pills, and she had two other bundles of fentanyl powder concealed under her clothing. Mm-mm-mm. Get this, a total of eight and a half pounds of fentanyl was seized during a traffic stop. Eight and a half, half pounds. How many hundreds of thousands of people and possibly millions would that kill? Now, Gomez's outfit was all black and it included a lace veil worn in her hair. With a Bible in her lap, cops contend Gomez sought to disguise herself as a trustworthy member of a religious order. What is that, a Satan worshiper? She's been charged with possession of narcotics for sale and transportation of narcotics for sale. Gomez and her 52-year-old husband are being held in the county jail in lieu of $25,000 bond. And I'll be real honest with you, I don't think that's enough. I think that bond should be much higher. Now, this next story, (laughs) the title, it says it all. Is that a sex doll inside your body bag? That's kind of strange, huh? Investigators charged that a funeral home worker planned to use a body bag to smuggle a life-size sex doll 
out of the home of a man who died in his Nebraska residence. Ryan Smith, 42, Mr. Dumbass. He was arrested in October for allegedly breaking into the Omaha apartment where the deceased man lived. Now, at the time, Smith was working for the Mid-America First Call, which handles removals, transportation, embalming, cremations, and shipouts. Now, a shipout, I think, is where they transport a body that's going to be buried in a different location to another state or another city. I'm not sure, but that's the best I can come up with. Here's what happened. Smith and a co-worker were dispatched to the Rock Creek Apartments to collect the decedent's body. Inside the unit, a sheriff's deputy noted, quote, near the body of the bed was a very real life-size version of an adult female. Both of the males that came to collect the body made comments about the sex doll found on location. Now, Smith's initial entry to the apartment was with law enforcement personnel, and they subsequently locked and secured the home when they all left. But later that day, here comes Mr. Smith. Allegedly, he re- allegedly returned. Allegedly. The son of a bitch returned. Sorry. The son of a gun returned to the residence carrying a body bag, telling apartment complex staff that he was acting on behalf of the sheriff's office. Oh, he's official now. And he wished to collect the sex doll located inside the deceased tenant's apartment for evidentiary purposes. <laughs> what evidence you going to, well, I don't even want to think about the evidence you might get off of that. Additionally, he told workers that he was there to collect the stretcher he'd left behind. After Smith, Smith was left into the apartment a second time, a management official discovered the unit's front door was dead bolted and latched with a chain across the door. Hmm. Wonder what's going on inside with Mr. Pervert. The complex representative confronted Smith, whose shirt was untucked and his pants were in disarray. Not saying anything here. You just make out of that what you will. And told him that no property could be removed from the dead man's home. Well, now, Mr. Pervert, as he's leaving, he goes up to one of the development employees and uh, he asked the janitor, he's like, hey, hey, when's the manager go home for the day? The manager told cops that she feared Smith was going to return to the complex, break in and steal that doll. Details about Smith's actions are contained in a judicial order filed last week denying his motion challenging a probable cause finding that he committed attempted burglary. And only a judge can write this. You just got to love the language. A district court judge found that, quote, Smith unlawfully entered the apartment with the body bag, which is indicative, based on circumstantial evidence, that he had the intent to take the sex doll, an item of nominal value. Therefore, the court finds the defendant committed a substantial step and a course of contact intended to culminate in the commission of burglary. Damn. A date for the next appearance by Smith, who is free on bond, has not been scheduled. Oh, what a sicko. And this, I just want to throw in this last story. I thought it was cute, uh, a little bit scary too, but uh, this happened in North Dakota. After North Dakota cops pulled over a vehicle and recognized a strong odor of weed, the driver's four-year-old daughter gave, up, <laughs> gave officers the lowdown on ownership of drug paraphernalia found in the car. Hey, that's mommy's. That's what this little four-year-old girl said in reference to a glass marijuana pipe that police found in the auto's back seat where the little girl was sitting next to her one-year-old brother. The child then added, oh, mommy smokes weed all the time. <laughs> Kids are honest, aren't they? So that's Caitlin Campbell, 20 years old, was charged with felony child endangerment and misdemeanor possession of drug paraphernalia in connection with the traffic stop last Thursday. A passenger in the 2007 Chevy Malibu was hit with the same charges and a drug possession count after she claimed ownership of the weed, ownership of the weed found in the car. Campbell's currently free on bond. No word yet as to what conversation she had with her four-year-old daughter afterwards. You know, kids are honest. I'm just a little concerned uh, about the conversation that mommy might have had with her daughter after that. I hope everything's okay. Um, And I I just tell you guys, I'm going to have a special on Patreon uh, about weed legalization. I'm going to bring in some facts and some research. We'll have a discussion. I'll give you my thoughts. I might be a little, you might be a little surprised to hear my thoughts on certain things, but uh, it's just, you know, it's the elephant in the room as to what's going on right now. So if you're not on Patreon, come on over. I should hope to have that out later this month. Okay. So back to today's episode, our guest is Richard Rybecki. He's called Rick to his friends. Now, Rick is a retired 29 year veteran of the Chicago police department. I mean, think about that. Holy cow. 29 years in Chicago. I've got a cousin that retired from Chicago as a lieutenant also. He told me some crazy stories. Now, as you're going to hear today, Rick is a legacy in the department, meaning he's got several 
uh, family members on the job before he came along. He worked numerous sections within the police department, including homicide detective, before being promoted to lieutenant and commanding officer of the Area 3 Homicide, Sex, Gang Crimes Unit of the Detective Division. But rather than staying on longer where he would almost certainly be promoted even higher because he was on his way up, Rick decided to put his family first. Wow. Something that most cops, military personnel, and first responders have a hard time doing, your host included. And Rick pursued another passion, which he has been very successful at. at, And uh, he's going to tell you all about that, so I'm not going to waste your time. But So now, to find out more about Rick's career and his current passion, you know what you got to do here, right? You have to get in, sit down, shut up, and hold on. Here we go once again with the biggest, baddest, most dangerous game of all, the Game of Crimes. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Game of Crimes with Murph in the Morning. This is episode 148. And let's just hope things don't change, because if it does, I'll never be able to edit that number out. Thank you so much for coming back. Your loyalty means the world to me. Uh, Seriously, could not do this and would not want to do it if you guys didn't want to listen. So thank you for continuing to come back. Please tell your friends about us. Bring them over. You already know the guests we have on here. Some you can find other places, but some you won't find any other places. And and this is a podcast all about portraying law enforcement, military, and first responders in the most positive light. Do we have a few bad apples? Occasionally, but it's so small, it really doesn't make a difference, not to us. And you've heard us say this time and time again, even when Morgan on here was on here, nobody hates a bad cop more than a good cop. And we continue with that sentiment here. So today, honored to have Mr. Richard Rick Rybecki, I get to call him Rick because we've been friends now for what, four, maybe five days? That's about it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, and in the law enforcement world, that's like a lifetime, you know. We're all <laughs> brothers and sisters in the Blue Brotherhood here. So, uh, Rick is a retired Chicago police officer, 29 years service. Um, I've got a cousin, we were comparing notes here last week, and I've got a cousin who's retired Chicago police officer, also was a lieutenant up there when he retired. And how many officers does Chicago PD have, Rick? Uh, well, it varies. Usually it's around 12,000. Yeah, and we know everyone. Yeah, absolutely. I know you do. It's, <laughs> what, and the reason I'm laughing is because the town I grew up in, West Virginia, didn't even have that many people. Oh, yes. <laughs> I'm a small town country boy. I grew up in Tennessee and West Virginia, so I'm like a cross between a redneck and a hillbilly here. But uh, 12,000, so you know, you call it, every time I talk to a Chicago copper, I'm like, hey, do you by any chance know Robbie Cooper? Or Bobby Cooper. We call him Bobby, but I think hmm. on the job, I think everybody called him Rob or Robbie. And it turns out Rich, Rich actually does. It's uh, I was shocked. I think you might be the first CPD guy I've talked to that did know Bob. <laughs> um, and like I told you, just a quick little story. I was I went up to Chicago, and I think it was December of 97 and to testify in a federal trial up there. Um, the last undercover I did in North Carolina or in, with DEA was in North Carolina buying weed from some rednecks and uh, turned out their sources were in Chicago. And so DEA Chicago locked them up and I went up to provide testimony. So Bobby called and he said, uh, he said, Hey, listen, I'm on the evening shift. I'm going to pick you up at your hotel this evening and uh, we'll take you out in the CPD car. You can see what Chicago is all about. And we did. had a blast. I don't get to see him very often. I would, actually, we've lost touch now. I haven't talked to him probably in 20 years, but uh, the, the district he was working in was where the old Cabrini green housing project was. I had no idea what that was. I learned very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> and as I understand, Rick, it's not there anymore, right? No, no. They've they've torn they've torn that down and uh, so many others to uh housing projects. That was just a terrible failed experiment. Oh my gosh. <clears throat> that was I know when we pulled up, Bob had his all his guys from his squad were there and so we all converged from different angles on the building. We went in and, and they just checked for safety issues and, and uh make sure everything's okay. You didn't take the elevator, did you? Oh, no. <laughs> I got to no. tell you. They had you gone never through, take those elevators. They had gone through and busted out all the lights in there, so it was very, very dark. Yeah. And, oh, yeah. Uh, so anyway, we come out, and it's snowing. And he said, listen, we're going to, okay, now we're going to run back to the cruiser, hop in and close the door immediately. 
like Bobby, I, I'm not going to melt if I get snow on me. I mean, I know I'm a Southern boy, but he's like, no, you idiot. They're going to throw cans of food at us as we run back to our cruisers. And if one hits you, it's going to kill you. <laughs> <laughs> so we did, we ran back. We didn't get hit with any cans, but, uh, uh, just want to mention also how I met Rick. And that was through an old friend of ours, uh, Patrick O'Donnell. You may remember him from episode 77. That was November 21st of 1920. 19, 2022. Holy cow. Even I wasn't around in 1922. Uh, Patrick was a sergeant on Milwaukee Police Department. We call him Sarge. Uh, he has his own podcast, Cops and Writers, which I highly encourage you to go listen to. Patrick's just, you know, whenever I have an issue, I call Patrick and he responds immediately. You know, it's just, it's unbelievable. And we've never even met in person, just like you and I, Rick. But yeah, that's part of the yeah. brotherhood and the sisterhood of oh, law yeah. enforcement. He, yeah. He's a great guy. Great he's guy. Fantastic. I saw you mentioned him on your website too. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I met him through his his Caps and Writers podcast. You know, I'm uh, author myself, and um, I was looking to connect with other um, law enforcement who who wrote, and uh, so I jumped on that law that that uh, website, his uh, Facebook page actually, and it's a question and answer thing. A lot of people who don't have law enforcement experience um, and want to write about it will go on and ask questions to get to get it right. And that was Pat's whole purpose of his Facebook pages. We're here to help you get it right. Um, and so I started answering questions on that. Next thing I know, he's giving me a call. Hey, wow, you know, you're a great contributor. And, uh, and we got to know each other that way. Such a nice guy. Such oh, a nice guy. Man. And I've seen pictures of him. I don't think I'm going to mess with him either. I think he still oh, no. hits the gym pretty no. hard. He's he's in the gym every day. He's a he's a lifter. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I go to the gym. Mm-hmm. It's usually to get you know something to drink and and uh, talk to my friends and then head on back to the house here. His wrists <laughs> are bigger than my thighs. <laughs> How about that? Uh, so Patrick, thank you very much, brother. We appreciate that. And uh, so Rick, we just want to. This is a, a very lighthearted podcast, as I mentioned to you. You know, we want to have some fun. If you've got some funny stories, you can tell us personal stories. We all love that, you know, and, and uh, you probably already figured out I'm an idiot. So, um, you know, feel free <laughs> to tell us anything. But we just always start off about where are you from? Where did you grow up? Uh, what were your family dynamics, brothers, sisters? Where did you go to high school? That kind of thing. Sure. Okay. I'll start. Uh, born and raised in Chicago. Chicagoan my entire life until I retired. <clears throat> my father was a cop. In Chicago, huh. and, you know, there's there's a trope for you, but mm-hmm. also two uncles. They came on right after World War II because it was a job. It was a good job. They were hiring back there, back then, and um, so they took that job. But mm-hmm. that's what it was to my dad and his two brothers. Uh, in fact, uh, we were at uh, my grandmother's funeral um, many, many years ago. I was on the job at that time for about five years, and uh, I was on a plainclothes uh felony arrest team uh, after five years, and um, I'm standing there with my two uncles and my dad, and uh, my one uncle says to me, you know, your father and me and your other uncle, we've got to combine 90 years on the job already. Whoa. And he goes, and you've done more work than we have in five. <laughs> Holy cow. <laughs> so... It was it was just a job to him. My dad was a, a traffic sergeant. You know, he worked in the traffic division. Um, my other uncle was a lockup keeper, uh, and uh, the third uncle he was what we called the abandoned auto man. He would ride around in districts and write tow reports on abandoned cars. That's it. Oh I don't, man! I don't think any of them ever arrested anybody. <laughs> wow! That, that, especially but, in Chicago. I mean, that's a yeah, tough town. But that's what it was back then. You know, it was it was just a job to a lot of those. A lot of those old timers. Wow. But uh, okay, so then I have three sisters. I'm uh, one older sister, two younger, and like I said, grew up uh, in Chicago. I, I don't remember when it was that I thought I wanted to go into law enforcement, that I wanted to be a cop. It had very little to do with my dad and my uncles, um, but it just kind of came to me at around high school. Um, I think when um, a couple of my friends uh, also wanted to go into law enforcement. So I kind of like joined the bandwagon. You know, it was one of those things like, oh, yeah, you know, I, I college didn't interest me. Um, and back then you can get on with just a, a high school degree. So um, but I did wind up going to college because, you know, you, you, you're not going on the police department when you're 18 years old. So I had to do something, majored in law enforcement. 
mm-hmm. criminal justice. And uh, <clears throat> when the first test became available, I took it. And I think that was in 75. And uh, 20,000 people took that test, an entrance exam. Holy cow. 20,000. There was a big hiring surge back then. Uh, the feds had given a lot of money to, to local law enforcement for hiring. <clears throat> so I took the test, and two years later, I was hired, actually, in one of the first classes. That's how long it took them to go through the whole process. Wow. Um, that was, you know, um, holy cow, that's 20,000. Do you know how many positions they had open back then? Uh, they wound up hiring about 3,000, 3,500 people, I think, off that list. Um, yeah, uh, total. It, it went on for years. Chicago was notorious for giving their tests few and far between. Hmm. So, you know, when it, I think the next test after that 75 test was probably 81 or 82. Wow. You know, because they just kept pulling off that list. Yeah. Yeah. Let me ask you before we go get any further here. When you were in high school, did you play any sports? What were your interests there? I ran track. That's oh. it. So, I, you know, I was <laughs> one of the one of the things he had to do in the police academy to, to graduate was run a mile under eight minutes. Uh, you know, and so, well, I had that down. That was no problem. So, so yeah, I pretty much just ran track. And Were, uh, were you a sprinter or a distance guy? Oh, a distance guy. Well, actually, kind of in between. I ran the 880, which is like two laps around the uh, mm-hmm. around the track. Yeah, that's that's like so, two more laps I, than I ran. Yeah, I I saw a lot of asses and elbows when I ran. <laughs> I was always in the back. <laughs> oh, come on now, come on now. It's, nobody's around any longer to dispute it. You could say you won every race you ever ran in. <laughs> That's right. That's right. In fact, the high school I went to is closed now, too, so I'm sure all the records are gone. There you go. There you go. Of course, you were. I'm sure you were chasing girls back during that time. Oh, sure. Yeah. Uh, everybody did. Uh, I hung out with a regular crowd, you know. It's um, four or five guys, four or five girls, you know. One of our favorite activities was going to the drive-in as a group, you know, nothing. Mm-hmm. But <laughs> we wind up taking my car and all the guys would hide in the trunk and the girls would go in and pay. And uh, then we'd pile out of the trunk once we got inside. <laughs> I'm sure they knew we did because we were laughing and giggling the whole time while we we're in the trunk. Yeah. You know, <laughs> oh. Hoping that the girls would let us out. <laughs> yeah, that's, seems to, you know, I think that's something that happened at most drive-in theaters back during the day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, what, what, just out of curiosity, what year did you graduate high school? 71. 71. 71, yeah. So I'm an old guy. I'm an old guy now. I've been wow. retired 18 years. Wow. You know, so, yeah, and they've been wonderful. But, man, did they go by fast. Oh. Yeah, they do. I, I, we're going to get into that. I've been retired yeah. uh, coming up on 11 years, and it seems like a year ago, yeah. you know, just coming off the job. And what's amazing is how the names change in your agency. I mean, I oh, used yeah. to know everybody in DEA, and, heck, I don't know hardly yeah. anybody now. Yeah. I actually, after I retired, I retired in 06, um, about six months afterwards, before I moved to Florida, um, I went back to, to see the old guys. Mm -hmm. I knew one guy out of maybe 50 people. I knew one guy. The the, the turnover was that great. Yep. You know, it's like, everybody was gone. Everybody was gone. Well, you know, hearing too, in the last few years with the anti-police sentiment that's been going around, defund the police and all that bullshit, you know, I know a lot of guys who... If they're still in the job, where are they become reactive rather than proactive oh, in their absolutely. enforcement? The uniform yeah. guys yeah. and the agents—I mean, they're bailing out as soon as they get their twenty in, so they could get another career started. Which is, you know, it's a sad testament to our country. But you know, when you let yeah. when you let things like that fester and grow, that's what you end up with. You don't have. This is certainly not not a, a dig on law enforcement now, not not the men and women out there that are facing danger every day but you're losing all that experience and talent oh. it, it's just yeah. it's crazy what's going on yeah. this, you know it seems like it might be coming back you know towards no, the I center so. a little bit but yeah. we've got a ways to go yeah. so, so at uh, the time i retired it was just about the advent of that where or the police were starting to to back off um and and kind of turtle up you know they 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 go into their shell because they mm-hmm. were afraid of getting into any kind of trouble um, yep. because of the lawsuits and, and 
uh, the media blasting them. And especially in Chicago, there were some big cases where, where coppers, you thought they did the right thing and they wind up getting fired and sued. So a lot of guys were backing off. When I was a detective years early, earlier, back in the late 1980s, our clear-up rate was like 85% on homicides. Wow. <clears throat> now they're below 50%. They're in the high 40s. You know, so that, that shows me that, um, yeah, maybe we've lost a lot of experience. There aren't as many good detectives. But I don't believe that as much as knowing that the detectives have just backed off. They're not going to extend themselves in any way, shape, or form. Well, you know, when you see that your agency is not going to back you, your prosecutors are not going to back you, the judges are corrupt. You know, I mean, I like Chicago. I'm not sure I could live in a place like that because it's just so big and I'm a small town boy. But uh, I've got a really good friend who's retired DEA up there, Scott. I won't mention his last name, but uh, just a guy I think the world of. And I, I read some of the things that he puts out about the citizen review committee that they try to come up with there up there. And they, he ran for it because he's got the experience. You know, he would he would be an excellent person to review shootings and things like that, complaints against police officers. But uh, the commission that is making those appointments, they don't want anybody with experience. You know, they want somebody right. that's going to agree with them. And it, it, I just don't see Chicago supporting the police the way they should up there. It's the, the city management. Uh, no, the, the city management, uh, the politics, they don't. They don't. It's it's. Um... You get more votes uh, if you're a police hater. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, that's true. Like even back in the day, with the original old Mayor Daley, Richard J. Daley, helped John Kennedy get elected, um, and then his son Richie Jr. Um, they didn't like the police, but they knew they needed them and they supported them because of that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, police, when you think about it, you're always bad news. You are always bad news firemen are always good news they're always saving somebody and the <laughs> fires the fires are not their fault right they're going in there to clean up uh -huh. you know this this fire and rescue people and save them not the police the police are uh just bad news um if you if you uh happen to get a big case and and you're working on it you're not doing it good enough or fast enough according to the media or the politicians. And, of course, there's always the scandal that comes up sooner or later, um, and mm -hmm. you're just bad news. And on top of that, the police departments um, took up about 45% of the city budget, so they didn't like that either. You know? <laughs> you're, you're, you're taking money from other departments, they thought. Yeah. Like, why are you giving so much money to the police department? You know? Well, you know, the question I would have, and, you know, I really try to stay away from politics here on the regular podcast. On our Patreon channel, I get a little more uh, personally opinionated. But um, if they would, you know, if the government, if the city government and the county government, Cook County and the city would take a strong stance on crime, then maybe you wouldn't have so many complaints against police officers. You know, it's, we've true. gotten so yeah. permissive in society is the way it seems to me. But yeah. Anyway, we can sit here and bitch about, I mean, uh, discuss that all day long, could we? Yeah, yeah we can. So <laughs> let me let okay. me pick up where I left off then for you. Well, um, you, you came out of high school and you went to college. Where did you go to yeah. college at? Uh, University of Illinois in Chicago. Uh, nice. They had a Chicago uh, campus, and um, I did not graduate there. I took the job in, uh, with the police department before I graduated, but I eventually graduated um, from another university while I was uh, – on the police department, they paid for it. You know, that was one of the advantages. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, tuition reimbursement. So I finished getting my degree there. Well, I was going to mention, too, I'll go when, when you were talking about that. I got hired as a police officer in 1975 in southern West Virginia. And we only had a 35-man department. You know, and I know that you guys probably had more of that on your squad every night. Yeah. 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 But uh, as – and I was going through college at the time, and there was a local college, Bluefield State College, that had a criminal justice program. I was one of the first students in their program and uh, came on this 35-man department. And we had – I think it was like out of 35 guys, there was 24, something like that, that had either a two-year degree or a four-year degree or were working uh -huh. towards one or the other. For this little, you know, small town police department, I thought it was fantastic that you had that kind of education. But here was the thing. They had the law enforcement assistance program, LEAP, back then. Yeah. 
Oh, yeah. Actually, that's how I got hired. They they authorized three positions for our department, and, and I was one of the three that got hired. But then also that gave them funding so that you got, you know, you're not, I started in 1975. I started out $9,600 mm-hmm. a year. And it, you had to work all your off-duty jobs. You had yes. to have extra, you know, side hustles as much as you could get to make ends meet. But the city would pay you a dollar for every college credit hour you had per month. Well, you know, if you had 90 bucks a month, that's not a lot of money now. But back then, when you're not making a whole lot, that was a lot of money. Oh, yeah. Real lot of money. And I'm kind of guessing that might be why why Chicago PD was able to uh, bring on so many people. I'm guessing LEAP had a lot to do with that. Yeah. Yeah. It was the same federal money. Yeah. And um, if I remember, they paid your salary for the first two years or something. That's how much money you were getting. The city was getting from uh, from the feds, yeah. Yeah, so, it's unbelievable. They yeah. wouldn't do that now. I remember when I, I came on in 77. I got it in January of 77, and I remember my first check, and uh, I was making 17000 a year. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which was... Two years later, a lot more than you were making, almost, you know, almost double what you were making. <laughs> yep. so. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, uh, I did six years in the city and then became a railroad cop in Norfolk, Virginia, mm-hmm. which, you know, is, is not what I wanted to do, but it was well, yeah. going through divorce and it doubled my salary. So it, financially, it really helped out. You got a good pension plan, too. The railroad well, place. they did, but, you know, I was, I was, rather than looking at the long term, I'm thinking, this is not what I want to do. I want to, yeah. you know. I want to do something exciting, and and that's how I ended up DEA. But anyway, let's get back to you. So you're you're out of high school. You're in college now. You've taken the police test. It's you got hired in '77, I think you said. Yeah, yeah, that was my first uh, first day on the job, January third, nineteen seventy seven. Now, how, what? How long was your police academy? Uh, Ten weeks uh, in classroom, mm-hmm. and then. Uh, uh, in and out uh, every couple of weeks. Then they put you in the field for field training um, for a couple of weeks. Then you'd go back in for some more classes. Um, then you'd come back out for another two weeks. And um, then it extended to a month. And pretty soon um, uh, you were going back maybe once every couple of months for some college credit courses. Hmm. Um and I think, again, there was federal money involved there. As many classes they could give you, they would because they got money for it. Oh, that's um, great. Yeah, and it was good. Um, our probation lasted a, a year, you know, from the date of your hire. To, so January 3rd of 1978, I was off probation. And um, pretty much they give you a baptism by fire. As soon as you're off probation, man, you're going out there. Here's your partner. Or if you're working days, you worked uh, a one-man car on days, <clears throat> but afternoons and midnights was a two-man car. Now, did your shifts? Did you did you have any say so what shift you went to, and did you rotate shifts? Oh no, not not at all, not, not at all. No, <laughs> uh, yeah, we if if you were lucky enough to get picked up on, we call them watches, not shifts. Um, if you were lucky enough to get picked up on a watch, if say the captain, the watch captain. Um, liked you or he needed a warm body or something and you got picked up, you would rotate with them. You would go from midnights to days to afternoons to midnights to days to afternoons. Every month, every 28 days, you would rotate. Um, If you weren't, if you were just one of the pool guys, you'd get stuck on afternoons. Mm. Um, But everybody liked working afternoons. That was a great, great watch to work. Yeah. Um, But I got picked up uh, relatively quickly. And um, my first partner was uh, a female first uh first partner i had was a female and she actually was in the academy class before me this is when there was a big push um for hiring women as police officers back then in the mid 70s right and being the misogynist i was at the time um i was like oh jesus i don't i don't want to work with a woman you know it's like but you, you didn't have a choice All right um and she was a little thing too you know she was a good head shorter than me um but a uh, uh, and a stocky built, let's put it that way. Okay, we'll go with a, that. A stocky built, <laughs> and uh, you know, and she had a mouth on her. Um, but uh, you know, we we kind of got along. But I was always worried. You always worried in the back of your head if you get into one of these physical altercations, what's going to happen? And back then, um, uh, there was only one radio between the two coppers. You only had one of the uh, motor old Motorola brick. Mm-hmm. portable radios mm-hmm. and she was driving that 
this one day and I had the radio and that's how it worked. So we get a do- call of a domestic. Um, so we, we go to this domestic, it's on afternoons and I've got the radio. We walk in, I walked in first thinking, you know, I'm going to be the man in case any bad stuff goes down here. Tough guy. You know, tough guy. Yeah. Well, bad stuff did go down. <laughs> as Ooh. soon as I walked in this, uh, big guy, huge, big red beard. He's a, I'm six foot and he's a full head taller than me. And he had to weigh 350 pounds. Mm. Boom, he immediately grabs me in a bear hug, and he's yelling, I'm going to rip your head off and <laughs> defecate down your neck. You know, oh, I mean, yeah. and, and, and my arms are pinned against my side. I can't even get to my radio, you know, and I'm thinking, oh, this is it. I'm dead now. Next thing I know, boom, he just collapses, crumpled on the ground, um, blood coming from the back of his head. And my mm-hmm. partner, the female, is standing there um, with a six-cell Kel light saying, don't touch my partner. She's yelling at him. Never touch my partner. You go girl. Yeah. I was like, Oh man. Right there. I said, I'm working with you any day you want. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I, I thought I was done for. And there she's got this baseball bat size Kel light. If, and if your listeners don't know, a Kel light is like an aircraft aluminum grade flashlight. Yep. Um, we're not allowed. The police aren't allowed to carry them anymore in Chicago uh, yep. because, because of incidents like this. And she just crowned this guy. We had to call an ambulance for him. Yeah, you know like, what? He earned it. Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And the wife wasn't happy. We we had to take him to the hospital because she was still in love with him despite the domestic. Yeah, wasn't um, that the way it always is? They have oh, a fight. Always. They want you to come in a referee, but then you end up being the bad guy. Oh, absolutely. All the time. More times than I care to remember. That's, you know, and for our listeners, that's why you always, I don't know if you've heard it or not, but we used to hear that, you know, domestics are always the dang- most dangerous calls you go on because <laughs> they hate each other yeah. when you get there, but they hate you yeah. when you leave. And they're, they're handled completely different these days. Uh, at least in Chicago, they are. It's like um, anybody now lays a hand on their spouse, they're going to jail automatic. Yeah. We don't need somebody else to sign complaints. We can sign the complaints you know, it's like he he slapped me. He's going to jail. Yeah. Well, I'm not going to sign complaints. I love him. That's too bad. He's going to jail yep. for taking him. You know, and, um, that, and that keeps the spouse from being the bad guy. Quite honestly, yeah. I, I actually approve of that. It's uh, yeah. nobody deserves to be abused. It's, yeah, uh, absolutely, absolutely, it's, and that's BS. what it's all about. And uh, you know, they send counselors out with the police now if you request them, and uh, it was easier in the old days. <laughs> <laughs> Go take yeah. a walk, buddy. Go take a walk, you know. Oh, yeah. Just don't come back drunk. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Times have really changed. I mean, oh, we're yeah. trying to be a, a gentler and kinder police. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Agency, I guess. <laughs> um, when you were going through the academy, now, were there any, and I know we're backing up just a tad here, but there's always funny things that happen in the academy. Oh, yeah. Can you remember any good stories? Uh, well, let's see. Now, for the first maybe six, eight weeks, I don't remember exactly, we were not sworn police officers yet. Mm -hmm. Um, We didn't have the badge. You didn't, obviously you didn't carry a gun. You know, you're, we were, we had a khaki uniform. It was just khaki pants, khaki shirts, uh, black tie. Um, But um, once they swore you in, handed you your star. We call it a star in Chicago. It's a five-pointed star, not a badge. Right. When they handed you your star, you uh, ordered up your gun and the guns were delivered. That's another thing. We owned our own weapons. Um, the city didn't issue them to us. Mm-hmm. We had our choice of, uh, you know, either you could buy a Ruger, a Smith & Wesson, or a uh, Colt chambered for a thirty eight caliber. That's it. That's all you could buy. Four inch barrels. Did you pay for it? Revolver. Yeah, you paid for it. We now we got a thing. uniform allowance. We got a, a, a generous uniform allowance, but we still had to pay. All, we bought all our uniforms, all our equipment, except the badge, the shield that went on the hat, a baton, and 12 rounds of ammunition. Oh, and a call box key. <laughs> oh, yeah. I remember those. Yeah. Call oh, collector's key. items now. Oh, yeah, they are. Yeah. <laughs> Wow. So you had to buy your, your leather gear, your holster and all that? Everything. Yeah. 
covered. See, we, we had to do that also in West Virginia, yeah. but I just thought it was because we were a small town department. I could imagine oh, no. Chicago PD yeah. not providing you that. Oh, no, they were cheap. <laughs> so what kind of um, revolver did you get? I had a uh, Smith & Wesson Model 66, a stainless steel three fifty seven Magnum. Good that gun. Could, that could, yeah, like that gun. Um, wound up giving it to my nephew. He's uh, he's a police officer in Chicago now, so he's got that as his backup weapon because everybody's carrying the semi-automatics now. Yeah, yeah, um, it was, yeah. I, I went with the uh, Colt four-inch Python. Man, that was a cool oh, looking gun. Oh, oh, you were wealthy. Well, you, <laughs> you know, those are all the rich kids that bought those. <laughs> well, it was uh, this was in 1975, and uh, so here's the funny thing. In West Virginia, you could become a police officer when you were 18. I became a Ooh, sworn wow. officer one month after I turned 19 years old. Wow. But I couldn't buy a gun. You had to be 21. I couldn't buy bullets. <laughs> so a, a buddy of mine on the police department, I gave him the money. He bought my gun, and my dad went and got me a couple cases of ammo or a couple boxes of ammo. And then the uh, the city was the same way. You know, you got you got like 18 rounds of ammo, and then they carried – you had an extra box of 50 rounds in the trunk. But guys always use that for personal stuff, you know, if, if oh, yeah. hunting rabbits or squirrel or whatever. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we could only carry uh, department-issued ammunition, mm. which was 128-grain lead nose hollow point, uh, 38 caliber. Um, that's it. And that was a terrible round, just yeah. a horrible round. It, it's, it's, it's very soft. It's uh, For our listeners, yeah. a lead round, yeah. you say lead, you think it's strong, yeah. but it's not. It's a very soft round. Um, I was in one shooting in my career um, when I was uh, a gang crimes officer. My partner and I were <laughs> uh, kind of undercover, just driving through the projects, buying dope if we could, you know, and uh, from the gangbangers. And uh, we got flagged down. We're driving. We were heading into the barn. We were, we were going in for the night. Kid flags us down. Hey, hey you want to buy some reefer? <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Slam on the the brakes on the trap car we were in and uh comes running up and he's got a it's middle of summer and he's got a jacket draped over his hand and i'm telling my partner uh uh-uh, uh this is bad and my partner says yeah you're right so as soon as the kid comes up to the window he ups the gun but my partner had his out he came up to the driver's side my partner was driving and my partner boom just let him have it right away so he shot him hit him right in the nose with that round that plus p round from a distance of about what 10 12 inches mm-hmm. and uh the kid lived yeah that that's why what a terrible round well we thought my partner had killed him you know well as soon as the gunfire started boom uh, the streets cleared uh everyone was gone we get out the kids laying on the ground bleeding from the face we call for the ambulance call in a 10-1 uh, officer needs assistance uh police involved shooting and as we're you know waiting it seemed like days, but it was actually seconds mm-hmm. before you hear the sirens coming. The kid starts to get up, and he tries to run away. We had to knock him down. Oh my it's like, gosh. I'm like, Bob, you shot him from a foot away in the face. How yeah. does he get up? Well, <laughs> so was, uh, that you know, yeah. there was. I had a similar incident where uh, there was a. Um, a party at the city auditorium in this little town in West Virginia. And, and one guy shot another guy point blank in the head with a, uh, you know, a, a very soft bullet, a lead bullet. Okay. And so he goes to the hospital and he was, this guy was the guy that got shot, had been in jail numerous times. He was one of the thugs mm-hmm. and the guy that shot him was a thug. And so I went, it was my, we called it a beat. I went down, you know, it's on my beat. So I went to the hospital and I'm trying to get a dying declaration because he's been shot in the head. And, you know, and he's like, Murph, get away from me, get away. I don't want to tell you anything. I'm like, don't you, man, you, there's a good chance you're going to die here. You know, don't you want the guy that shot you to pay? Because I wanted to put the guy in jail. You know? And uh, he's like, no, no, no. You know, and he just, he never would give a statement. And then about a day later, he walked out of the hospital because the bullet hit the skull and, and just kind of circled around his head. Yeah. I've seen that plenty of times too. Um, mostly with 22 long rifles. The, yeah. The, that 22 long rifle round. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It just. Hit the hit the skull and stick under the skin and make a couple of circles. <laughs> <laughs> You'd think it was scalp him doing that, but yeah, anyway, that's like, another oh, story. Man. <laughs> yeah, I've seen that. Yeah, that's something. That's wow. something. So um, now I was looking at uh, your website, and we'll, we'll give all our listeners all this information towards the end here. 
But you carried a variety. In 29 years, you had a lot of different assignments here, moving up through the ranks and everything. So, you know, and, yes, and I'll did. just quickly say patrol officer to tactical officer to gang crime specialist to detective to patrol sergeant to detective sergeant to patrol lieutenant to detective lieutenant. And your last assignment before you retired, you were the lieutenant, the commanding officer of Area 3 Homicide Sex Gang Crimes Unit uh, in the Detective Bureau. Yeah. Now, I don't want to say it, it sounds like you can't hold a job, but, but you know. <laughs> uh, so tell us a little about, so tell us a little bit about the differences in some of those and, and then how, what really drew you into homicide? I mean, what's the attraction there? Okay. Um, well, I started out obviously in patrol. When you get out of the academy, you're, you're right into patrol. Mm -hmm. um, the backbone of every police department, as, as they say. Yep. Uh, and uh, spent some time there, but I was uh, an aggressive officer. I liked working. You know, I like getting the bad guy and uh, I'd handle all my assignments. I'd handle them well. And um, every district had what they call a tactical team, which was uh, it started out as a vice team in, in every district. Again, Chicago has districts, not precincts like they do on the East Coast. Um, I think I think more Midwest and West Western states have have districts. They call their precincts mm -hmm. districts. Yeah. But every district. uh had uh, one of these tactical teams, uh, and it was uh, uh, three teams, only worked days or afternoons, and uh, supervised by a lieutenant, and each team had a sergeant, and you were plain clothes, and um, you were basically a high-arrest team. You're, you're out there looking looking for heads. You're just high-arrest, and uh, narcotics and gang activity was a big part of it. Vice crimes, can't, nobody arrest anybody for gambling anymore. <laughs> but, yeah. Uh, prostitution. So. Uh, Apparently, the lieutenant took notice of my arrest rate as a patrolman, and he put me on the tactical team. And uh, so I worked there. And then we got a new commander of the district. Each district is led by a commander who has several captains on each watch under him. The, the commander changed politics mm -hmm. in the city. We got a new commander in, um, and uh, he also took notice uh, of me. And when he got transferred, he got promoted he brought me and a bunch of other guys along with him. All of a sudden now you're attached to this guy. You are one of his guys. Mm -hmm. And that happens a lot in Chicago. You become part of this, this guy's clique and you'll follow him around and he'll bring you along with him because you know, a lot of people like to say it's nepotism. A lot of the other couples will say, Hey, why did you get that job? Why didn't I get that job? Well, it's because, one, I worked, and he noticed me, and he trusts me now. So who is he going to pick? You, who doesn't do anything or does um, he doesn't know or trust yet, over me, the guy he trusts. So, you know, you know, I get why a lot of coppers, good hardworking coppers, get looked over sometimes. But, mm -hmm. you know, you, you've got you've to uh, understand that if, if you and another guy are equal, in all your skills and talents, but this this exempt member, this commander or deputy chief knows you, who's he going to pick? He's going to well, pick the guy he knows already and trusts. Yeah, you, you want to do something to distinguish yourself, but at the same time, if I'm in his shoes, I want to surround myself by like-minded people. Exactly, exactly. You put it much better than I did. <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, you know, I got on the tactical team. I followed him to another district. I followed this commander to another district. Then he got promoted again um, to a deputy superintendent. He was like the, you know, number five guy in the police department at that time. Wow. So I had very little contact with him, but he moved us all into a, a citywide gang crimes unit and uh, worked there for, for many, many years uh, until I got promoted. I took a test for detective um, and uh, got promoted to detective. So once I was promoted to detective, which is what I, I kind of always wanted to do on, on the job, I always wanted, you know, those are the guys behind the yellow tape. They yeah. knew what was going on. Yeah. You know, yeah. I wanted to be one of those guys that knows what's going on. I always had that with me. So uh became a detective and I, <laughs> I got sent to a South side unit. I lived on the North side. I got sent to a South side detective unit uh, in property crimes and I hated it. Just hated it. Property crimes. 
you know, on the south side of Chicago, you're chasing the same 19 inch black and white TV around the neighborhood. Everybody is stealing it. You know, one guy steals it from them. Another guy steals it from that guy. And another guy steals it from that guy, you know, in these crappy little burglaries, it was, it was just horrible. So mm-hmm. I hated it. And so I got a phone call from my former boss in gang crimes. He says, listen, you want to come back to gang crimes? We'll make you a gang crime specialist. Now, there's a difference between gang crime specialist and a gang crimes officer, and that is just pretty much uh, um, your equivalent to a detective. Mm-hmm. If you were going to promote someone to a gang crime specialist, he would go to school with the detectives. So it's it's equivalent. It's the same basic rank. So he goes, yeah. you, you know, you can be a gang crime specialist. You went through the detective school. I said, yeah, sure. I want to go back because I hate this, you know, mm-hmm. and uh, – wound up going back and worked for a year, year and a half as a gang crime specialist. And then uh, openings came up in the detective unit that I wanted to go to in uh, in the violent crime section, which handled all the robberies, aggravated batteries, homicides. Um, we called it violent crimes back then. It was violent crimes and property crimes in the detective division. So I, uh, I put a request in for a transfer from gang crimes to um, the detective division. And I get a phone call and said, you can't do that. You're not a detective. I said, well, yes, I am. I went through detective school and I, I chose to go the gang crimes route, but now I want to go back and be a detective. Oh no, you can't do that. Well, now I'm ticked off, right? I hung up the phone and I was in the office at the time. And the guy who works the telephones in the office, the desk guy, who I barely knew. And he goes, you know, I overheard your conversation. Um, you should talk to a friend of mine. I said, yeah, sure. Okay. What's he going to do for me? He goes, eh, he works down at the first deputy's office. Um, well, the first deputy superintendent is the number two guy in the police department. And he's mm-hmm. actually kind of like the power behind the throne. Oh, <laughs> he's, yeah. like, he's like the real guy that runs the police department, the day-to-day activities of the police department. Yeah. So uh, he's like, well, you know, okay, I'll go see him. So <clears throat> he calls his friend. friend says, send him down. So I go down there, and it turns out that this patrolman is the first deputy's personal secretary. And he goes, I tell him this story. He says, you know, I I got promoted to detective. I went to this place, so I didn't like it. I went back to gang crimes as a specialist, and uh, now I want to go back to detective division. He goes, well, this is simple. All you need is a job code title change. What the hell is that? What is a job code title change? <laughs> You're just in the wrong job code title. I, I just got to change it. Well, how do we do that? He goes, well, you got to uh, type out a personal action request form. Goes, okay, you got one? I'll, I'll do it here. He goes, let me do it for you. He puts one in there, and he's asking me my name and all this stuff, and he types wow. it up, and he hands it to me. I go, okay, now what? He goes, well, you have to have the first deputy sign it. I said, his door's right there. Is he in? He goes, you know what? I better take that in. He goes in. He's not gone for five seconds, and he comes right back out, and it's signed. And I never see the first deputy, and it's signed. And I go, I'm thinking in my head, the first deputy's not even in his office. This guy just went in there, signed his name, because he signs all kinds of stuff for the first deputy every day, right? Oh, yeah. I said, well, thanks a lot. You know, what do I do now? He goes, well, go across the hall to the detective division headquarters and ask them where you're working tomorrow. (laughs) <laughs> that just quick? Like, yeah, just like that. I was like, oh my God, I, I can't believe this is going on. So it's always always about knowing the right guy. <laughs> oh, absolutely. <laughs> you know? But what bottle did you buy that guy, that secretary? Oh, in the first I, got, I got him a good one. I got him a good one. Yeah. How'd I know that? A nice bottle of scotch. So hey. I walk over to the detective division and the guy that goes, yeah, yeah, what do you want? And I hand him this, this, power form we called it a personal action request form and he looks at it and he's reading it and you can see his face just changing as he's reading it and he like looks up at me and he goes where do you want to go <laughs> you know because he's got this form just some mo- walks into his office and hands him this power form says i'm a detective as of tomorrow wow he's got to be thinking well this guy is heavier than well doo doo you know <laughs> So, and this is in the middle of a uh, of a month. This is in the middle of the, and people just don't get transferred in the middle of the month. Right. It's always at the end of the, the period. Um, and this is in the middle. And so he's stunned. He's like, well, where do you want to go? He says, I want to go to Area 4 Violent Crimes. He laughs. 
No. And he covers his mouth. Okay. <laughs> he signs it. He brings it back, has his boss sign it. He says, okay, give him a call. Ask him what time you're starting tomorrow. And that's what happened. So, and, all right, well, now what's Area 4? Area 4 is, is one of the worst sections of the city. It's uh, It had uh, the most homicides per year, mm -hmm. uh, every year. For, for years and years and years. It, it's just a horrible, a lot of housing projects, a lot of uh, um, economically depressed areas. Every other house was a vacant lot. You know, just, you, you know, I don't want to use the term, but it's a slum area. It's just, just yeah. a horrible area. Yeah. Um, it was made up of, uh, the, the city is divided into five areas. Um, and each area covers four or five districts within within that area. And that's how the de detectives operate. They, they work an area. So you're, you're covering actually about four or five different districts doing, doing detective work in those areas. Um, so uh, I went to area four and um, they were stunned too. It's like, Oh my God, who is this guy? He's coming in the middle, of, in the middle of the period. So. And volunteered. Um, yeah. And volunteered. Yeah. But that's where I wanted to work. I, you know, I, I'm thinking if I'm going to learn homicide, I want to learn, from the best and area four's homicide detectives had the reputation of being the best in the city. And, Absolutely. Well, man, that's where you want to go. You, you want to learn from the best. And, and I did, I learned from the best in the city. Let me they ask were, you a question right. about when you were doing gangs, are we talking about street gangs, organized gangs, or are we talking about organized crime, like the mafia, like the John Gotti's uh, and those kind street, of people? Street gangs, street okay. gangs. Um, it was all street gangs. Our organized crime unit of the detective division handled, handled, the organized crime people. So gotcha. I I did um, get involved in one mob hit as a as a homicide detective. This is years after the story I just told you about that. I was working with the guy who actually broke me in on homicide work because you know as a new detective thrown into violent crimes, they're not assigning you homicides right off the bat. You're handling every little piece of crap oh, yeah. uh, investigation that comes along. You know the kid walking down the street to get shot in the leg. You know, the report, all the re narrative in the report reads is heard shot, felt pain. He doesn't know who did it. You know, it's like, <laughs> so those are the things we should, got to We shouldn't laugh at things like that, but they yeah. are funny. <laughs> but uh, so, you know, when I started working homicide, they, they gave me this very experienced detective to teach me the ropes. And um, one, of the, one of the cases we got was a car bombing. Um in uh, the Little Italy district of uh, Chicago, the neighborhood uh, along Taylor Street. Mm -hmm. And a uh, guy comes out of a house, gets in his car, boom, he blows up. He lived. You're kidding. No, he lived. So um, in this type of investigation, obviously, uh, ATF is out on the scene. Um, the FBI is out there. And I have nothing but respect for ATF and the technical agents involved with the FBI. Their mm -hmm. bomb unit, along with ATFs, they were the best. Yeah. Um, their, their, uh, their technical people are the best. Best in the world. They were finding pieces of the device, the bomb, a block away. You know, it's like amazing, just amazing. Yeah. They, yep. they were able to tell from the pieces they found, okay, this is the triggering mechanism. It was on a mercury switch, you know, uh, a shaker switch. You know, it's like, wow, this is amazing stuff. But yep. anyway, we, we obviously had to hand that one off to the FBI. The guy lived, and the story was, uh, well, he didn't live long. He lived about another year before he got shotgunned to his death in the, in the suburbs. Holy um, his problem was he was just a peripheral player with the mob, you know, involved in some trucking firm. You know, the Teamsters Union probably got the job because they told him, you're going to hire this guy. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, – his, he made the mistake of um, dating and sleeping with the wife of an incarcerated mob hitman. <laughs> oh, my God. Now, that just brings a whole nebel, another definition to the word stupid. That's right. Oh Absolutely. Um, the, the hitman's name was Harry Ailman. I, you know, he's kind of notorious in Chicago. But, oh. uh, yeah. Now, how stupid can you be, right? Are you You're going to... You're going to be sitting, baffing the wife of a hitman while he's in jail? No. I'm just sitting here thinking, how, just what you said, how stupid can you be? <laughs> Did you think he wasn't going to find out? <laughs> what, uh, what crime family were they associated with? Do you remember? Uh, um, 
No, I don't. Uh, no, I don't. But there was uh, there was only a couple in Chicago. There was only two. It's not like uh, New York where they had the five boroughs and the five families. Yeah. You know, there was yeah. pretty much one with a lot of peripheral players. You know, um, the the mob I knew from Chicago in that little Italy area of Chicago was more like Goodfellas than anything else. Like if you've seen the movie Goodfellas, oh, yeah. that's what it was. They were street crews. And yep. They were street crews, and they're just passing the tribute up the line. You know, the the street boss gets his end, and then he sends his end up up the line. Got to pay the piper. Yeah, those those are the guys I knew. And, uh, it, well, as a matter of fact, there was a, another case where we had to go to one of the street crew bosses for help. Um, there was a, a murder of a young lady, um, and she was last seen with another peripheral player from the map. Now he's on the run. We can't find him. We have fairly good evidence he's, he's the uh, bad guy, but we can't find him. So, you know, we start knocking on some of these map guys, these street crew guys doors, and they're all telling us to go pound sand, you know, it's like, get lost, get lost. Well, finally, my partner has the idea. Is, well, listen, we got to call their boss. We got to ask permission for these guys to talk to us. Give them permission to talk to us. So we called him in. He comes into our office with his lawyer. He says, I'm, I got nothing to say to you. I says, well, you don't know what we're here to ask you yet. You know, yeah. his lawyer, my client's not going to talk. Here's what we want. We want you to give permission to your guys to talk to us about this murder, about this guy who we confident murdered this young girl who you knew right he's like yeah i didn't know her he says well she's dead she was murdered and we want to talk to this guy he goes okay give me a phone in 10 minutes you give him a phone in a private room 10 minutes later he comes out and says everybody will talk to you now wow and that's what happened it's like and we caught the guy within hours of that and it's wow. like yeah it's like you know and i know i mean i'm a small town cop it's it's just mind boggling that you have to go, you know, you want to say we're all type A's, you know, of course yeah. the criminals are too. That's the problem. But the fact that the here, you know, the PD is going, the Chicago police department is going to an organized crime figure to get permission and you understand it, but it just still like WTF. This just doesn't sound right. Yeah. Well, his people would just not talk to us yep. unless they got permission from him. Well, yeah, and that's, so. sometimes that's what you got to do things like that oh, to yeah. solve the case. And that's what yeah. it's all about. Sometimes Absolutely. as hard as it is, we got to set our egos aside sometimes. Yeah. And, and you got to be nice to people that you just as soon see, you know, put under the jail. But, but that kind of goes along with the job. But also after we were done and he's walking out with his lawyer, the the street boss tells us, remember this, that I helped you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Nothing free in life. Yeah, that's right. That's right. I, uh, might, I might need your assistance someday. Well, you're not getting that kind of assistance, but, yeah, you know. Yeah, absolutely. That makes it. That makes it uh, we will well, talk that, to the state's attorney for you. Or yeah, the that kind of brings it back around. Yeah. <laughs> now, um, so now you, you make it up to sergeant. and you, So when you when you get promoted, like you go to uh, a sergeant, you have to go back to patrol. You can make a lieutenant. You got to go back to patrol. Yeah. yeah. You know, I, I – really had no ambition to be a sergeant because working homicide was what I wanted to do. And I was doing it and really had no ambition. But then I wound up getting uh, working with another guy as, as time went on, I worked with another guy and, and um, he, he wanted to be promoted and we were partners and he's like, come on, uh, you should do it too. It's, it's the right thing to do. Um, get promoted. You're, you're good at what you do. And, you know, you can help other coppers and, Okay, okay. So I wind up going to study groups with them and taking the test, and I got promoted. You know, as a, mm -hmm. um, in the first class of sergeants, along with him, and uh, yeah, they send you back to patrol. They want you to remember your roots. They want you to know that job, so you can be better if you go further up the line again. Thank you. Uh, and I think it's a lot of guys, especially in specialized units like the detective division. Um, who were sergeants, they didn't like it. They didn't want to go back to patrol. If you were a homicide detective in New York, say, and you got promoted, you'd stay in the, in the bureau, in the detective bureau. Um, you would not go back to patrol. You, you climb the ranks through 
the detective bureau. Or if you're in patrol, you climb the ranks through patrol. Uh, in Chicago, that's not the case. Um, there's no saying you'll ever get back to the detective division if you're a detective and you get promoted to sergeant. Mm. So they send you back to patrol. And I think it's a good thing. You know, I was glad that I learned that job as a patrol sergeant before I did eventually get back to the detective division. It, it's very helpful. It's it, being able to to deal with other supervisors of your same rank. Uh, you know what they need from you, and you can explain then what you need from them. And there's that that little unsaid thing between you where you know, okay, you've done my job. I I, I I know you, I can trust when you, what you're telling me. Mm -hmm. So, and that's the way it is. It, when I made lieutenant also, that's the same way. Well, and two, you're, you, that, for me, it's kind of like going back to basics, you know, and, and, and I, that's a simple saying, but when things aren't going right, if you drop back to basics, it kind of helps you figure things out. But the benefit I see from that is you expand your connections. You know, it's oh, like you're expanding your network of people to where, you know, when I retired from DEA, we had, uh, I think 4,300 agents back there worldwide. And I could call anywhere in the world and get assistance from an agent just because you knew so many people. Absolutely. Uh, and so in the same is true. It's like you said at the very beginning, it's kind of who you know to get things yeah. done at times. Yeah. And as a matter of fact, uh, I went to uh, the 23rd district as a sergeant, a uh, patrol sergeant, uh, and that's Wrigleyville, you know, great place to work you know there's yeah. there's still their crime in a lot of those areas but you know wow summertime wrigleyville this is this is great it was uh, almost party <laughs> central um, and what is let me just guess what's in wrigleyville i'm, I'm going to guess wrigley stadium uh yeah uh the, the ball field so you know you've and you've got all the bars and the entertainment districts around that area yes um there was also boys town though um that was the uh the gay section of the city you know mm -hmm. um and that was cool. You know, I never, a lot of guys were like homophobic, you know, yeah. you know, even a lot of the girls and they were afraid to like, well, I'm not going into Wrigleyville into that bar. You know, that's a gay bar. So what, man, they're people too. Come on, you know? And, uh, and yeah, you'd get hit on every now and then by a guy, you know, but, uh, I took it as a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> Got to feed that ego where you can, right? Yeah, yeah. But I, I've, I've worked with guys who, who, man, they wanted to get out of there as quick as possible. It's yeah. Like, eh, come yeah. on. It's, it's no big deal. But, uh, yeah. Hey, players, this is the end of part one. As you know, part two comes out tomorrow on a Tuesday. In the meantime, on social media, go and check us out on, on X at Game of Crimes and on Facebook and Instagram at Game of Crimes Podcast. Also on Facebook, type in Game of Crimes fan page and join us for some more fun. Our website is GameOfCrimesPodcast.com. We've got a lot more information there, including all our episodes, the book list, which contains the books written by our guests, Game of Crimes merchandise, and a lot more. In the meantime, everybody stay safe. We'll see you tomorrow for part two.